you're in tune to another edition of The Public Interest, a weekly program produced by the Ministry of the Presidency that allows for interactions between the President and the media. As always, we have with us our Head of State, President David Granger. Welcome again, sir. Thank you very much. And joining us today, we have two very familiar faces, uh, Ms. Kiana Wilberg from the Kaichor News and Ms. Shonsa Samuels from the National Communications Network. Nice to have you again on the set, ladies. Thank you. Moving right into the program, Mr. President, in the past week we've seen a number of heinous interpersonal crimes and what appears to be gang-level robberies. Only recently the police issued a, wanting, a wanted bulletin for an overseas-based Guyanese who is allegedly involved in the murder of a carpenter in Barbies. Um, a number of other persons have also been arrested in relation to that matter. But in addition to that, there have been a number of high-profile robberies, particularly right here in the city. Um, in light of all of these threats, how does the administration and guarantee safety to its citizens? Uh, well, that's a tough question. What we can say is that we have taken a tough line uh, against criminality. Um, as you know, last year we set up a national security committee. We meet every single week. We have a policy of not tolerating any form of gang crimes, but I must admit that the interpersonal violence has, has been a continuing problem. We're working against interpersonal violence, the type of violence you reported at, um, on the quarantine where um, this uh, young man was killed by three other persons. These are people he knew. So this is not something um, that we could predict. These are people with whom he was familiar. And this is the type of uh, interpersonal crime that um, is very, very difficult to control. We are working to strengthen the community policing and the neighborhood policing um, uh, units of the police force in those uh, communities. We are also, as you know, um, putting in mounted police on the quarantine. Uh, and this was in response to the Black Bush Pole murders. And uh, countrywide, we are putting more policemen on the street, not only for Christmas, but also generally because we feel that um, most of these crimes occur at community level. These are not uh, big transnational crimes, um, but at community level, we know that the, the inflow of uh, illegal weapons has been a contributory factor. We also know that the inflow of drugs has been a factor because some of the uh, murders seem to be execution-type murders where drug deals have gone sour. So I would say that we have a robust response at three levels, one at the community level, uh, for the one you, talk, you spoke about. Second, at the, at the level um, of street crime where there is uh, apparently some banditry. There might be small groups of people who are equipped with uh, illegal firearms. And at the, the higher level, I would say that there is still the inflow of drugs, transnational, coming from other countries. And uh, the drug trade has been uh, fueling um, ex execution murders particularly. We also have problems in the hinterland where small gangs, two or three people, rob gold miners. So um, we are tackling crime robustly at all three levels. The police force has been given, or will be given, more um, support um, for the mounted, uh, uh, mounted police and also for all-terrain vehicles. I hope that within the next three years or so, we can start thinking about the aircraft for the police force because it's a wide area for them to patrol. So I would say the government has been responding in a, in a robust way. And although the numbers have been reduced, I agree that the perception of crime um, has not uh, diminished. And we're working to reassure the population that uh, the security forces are in control. And as you know, um, we are preparing right here in the Ministry of the Presidency to receive a team from the United Kingdom, security sector reform team. And uh, that team will be concerned with reforming the Guyana police force. It's a slow process, but I am very confident that uh, during 2017, you'll see improvements in the general crime picture. Thank you, sir. Kiana. Thank you. 
Mr. President, within the last two budgets, the public security sector has received uh, over $21 billion. Could you say that you're satisfied with how those allocations have translated into crime-fighting efforts, or do you believe more or better could have been done by Minister Ramjitan? I think it is inadequate. The amount of money is inadequate. I would certainly like to have given um, the police force in particular more, because as I mentioned when I responded to Vindy a minute ago, the, the police force needs assets such as all-terrain vehicles, it needs more horses um, to patrol those wide areas, particularly the Rupununi. And um, <laughs> remember, Rupununi is bigger than Costa Rica, and we need to put the horses there because that is where some of the narco-trafficking has taken place. Um, and we need aircraft. We need fixed-wing aircraft which could patrol our borders. Police force also needs to be brought up to strength. Um, regrettably, um, some policemen have had to be dismissed for uh, misbehavior and uh, to the extent that they are removed from their day-to-day -day duties, it means that some of their functions are not being performed. From, this, um, from the 15th of November, you would have seen an increased deployment of police uh, men and women. We are using the neighborhood police in a more aggressive way for law enforcement. We're using community police for law enforcement. And I would say that the money was well spent, but we need more, and we need to get more out of the police force. And that is why we've asked the British uh, government to assist with security sector reform. Mr. President, uh, how does your administration plan to encourage social informers, meaning that uh, persons at the community level, if they know of an incident that is an illegal incident that is taking place, they will be, you know, motivated or encouraged to go to the police force to, um, you know, indicate that such is taking place? Well, that's, um, that's a good um, question. It depends a lot on the confidence which ordinary citizens have in the police force, but it also depends on the organization structures which we have. There are three structures. One is what we call the special constabulary, which does you know, um, some duties protecting um, magistrates and ministers and so on. Two, there is the community policing, which is a real volunteer group, and thirdly, there is neighborhood policing. You also have uh, at the lower level um, you know, people involved in traffic control, but to come to the question that you have, yes, we are using um, different means to encourage young people, particularly, to go into the community policing. Not as informers, nobody wants to, to be called an informant, but um, to encourage them to cooperate with the police. The point I'm making is this. If there are vulnerable persons in any community, um, sometimes you've seen rape murders of very old women, 78 year old women, um, they've been raped and murdered. Um, people should be aware that these persons are vulnerable and there could be additional protection or policing in, in those areas. So I don't think you need to depend on informers. Police will always have informers, um, people who need to be paid for information. But I believe that in any given community, um, there will be sufficient community-minded people who will come out and say, such and such a person is, is a re-migrant or a deportee or is a bad character or had a reputation somewhere else in the country, we must keep our eyes on that person. So, yes, it's a good idea, but some structures already exist and the police force must make more use of those structures. I just have another question yes. on, on the topic. Uh, Minister Ramjitan had um, raised some concerns as it relates to illegal firearms coming over our porous borders, like through Brazil and um, Venezuela and so on. What um, structured measure will be put in place, or how do you see the government tackling this issue? At two levels. One, at the transnational level, we have to cooperate with other countries um, from which we feel the weapons are coming. Um, and as you know, Brazil is one of the largest manufacturers of small arms in the world. We have to cooperate with the Federal Police of Brazil and also with our neighbors, um, Suriname and Venezuela. Uh, secondly, we have to ensure that we have the assets on the ground and the policemen on the ground. Because these weapons don't come through the normal ports of entry. 
they could be smuggled. If you know the Rupununi, for example, you could walk across the border in Rupununi during dry weather. And of course, we know the notorious backtracking in Suriname, we're trying to control those routes. But um, as far as the movement of illegal weapons is concerned, unless you have more policemen and aircraft and other vehicles um, to enable the police to move around the country, it will be very, very difficult. There needs to be better enforcement so that if those weapons trickle into mining camps or, or timber grants or come into the city, there will be uh, regular searches. As you know, over the last two months, the policemen have been uh, other police forces have been searching nightclubs and other places where they believe that uh, illegal weapons could be used. But essentially, you're talking about more policemen on the ground and you're talking about more assets to control those porous borders. Do you have any other questions? Yes. Um, Mr. President, could you say what plans are in the pipeline to effectively address interpersonal violence within the next few years? There. There are several plans um, launched by the Ghana Police Force um, and also by the Ministries of Social Cohesion, Social Protection and Public Health. Uh, one, of course, is not regarded as a crime, that is self-harm, that is suicide, which the Ministry of Public Health is working on. But the Ministry of Social Cohesion has been working with groups and individuals to um, improve or to enhance the understanding that should exist between groups. People have to learn once again how to solve um, disputes or controversies without resorting to violence. Don't forget that we, many young people have grown up over the last 20 years uh, feeling that the only way to, I'm not blaming young people, mind you, because you're young and a lot of us are young, um, but persons have grown up feeling that the way to resolve any controversies may be with a gun and, or a knife. And we've seen these even at weddings, we've seen these even um, at the level of households between husband and wife, people are burn a house down. Now, it's, it's very difficult to prevent this type of crime. And that is why in answer to the previous question, I said there must be some resort to um, informal means uh, like neighborhoods, people would realize that they're, uh, maybe a husband and wife are you know, quarreling and sometimes the wife is brutalized or sometimes the husband is brutalized by the wife. But we must be able to report these matters to the regular police force who would visit them and give counseling. That's why I support uh, the recruitment of more female officers because sometimes uh, females who are injured by their husbands are reluctant to to go to report the offenses to male officers. Um, so if, by recruiting more female officers, I, I think that they could um, get the confidence of the abused wives or children and, uh, and, and we can bring the crime, we can control the crime. So it has to happen largely at the level at which it, it, it occurs. Uh, the enforcement has to be made at the level at which it occurs, that is household and family level. And uh, I see a greater role for community policing and neighborhood policing. I also see a greater role for the Ministry of Social Cohesion in helping young people to resolve problems without resorting to physical violence. Thank you, sir. I think now is a good time for us to move into the second segment of the program where we can ask questions on any topical matter. So, Mr. President, I'm going to start us off. You recently attended the COP22 uh, summit in Morocco. And prior to that, while attending the 71st UN General Assembly, you said that Guyana has emerged as a reliable partner in the fight against climate change. Sir, can you describe how this intersects with Guyana's push towards the development of a green state? Well, the worldwide partnership is essential. Becoming a green state is not um, an objective for one country alone. Um, we need to work with international partners. Most important, uh, as you know, Guyana is part of the Guyana Shield, an area bigger than Greenland. And we have to collaborate with Venezuela, Brazil, Suriname, French Guyana, and um, to some extent, uh, um, Colombia. Um, because we share a common, uh, a common um, area of biodiversity. 
Um, at the national level, um, we need to make our children and adults too more conscious of the need to protect the environment. Our rivers, our canals, our wetlands, our savannas, our um, coastal zone. And we will do this by introducing more green education um, in, in schools so that children growing up become conscious of the need to avoid you know, the, the lawless or reckless disposal of waste and reduce the use of um, plastics and styrofoam and also uh, prevent our, our animals, our fish, our birds, our uh, flora and fauna from, um, from destruction. So we are doing this um, through our education system and we are also um, implementing measures at the government level. We, as you know, we have created uh, several new tongues in 2016. We will create new protected areas, so each region would have a protected area, so that um, uh, there will be greater attentiveness to our flora and fauna. And um, we expect that at the commercial level, the business level, uh, there will be a greater adoption of not only green technologies in terms of generating uh, sustainable energy, um, solar energy, you know, at, uh, at printeries and business places and manufacturing enterprises, but also um, they would uh, use uh, sustainable energy in, in other areas in their homes and, um, and places of entertainment. So we see a lot more um, lighting that is powered by by, um, by solar energy, and we would like to invite uh, investors to come on board with wind, wind farms and, and solar farms. So it is a total program, it's a holistic approach to the green state. Um, it is not just a matter of low carbon development strategy, but it is about our entire landscape, it's about biodiversity, it's about the education uh, of our children so that we would like to see a lot more um, students from foreign countries coming into our country to study our biodiversity. So it's a total new plan and uh, over the, the next three years we will see um, that that green state is becoming a reality. More people are understanding that and I'm convinced in fact um, tomorrow or this weekend uh, the Demara Bank is, is, um, is launching a project we, um, a little earlier on, we had um, a laboratory in Georgetown which uh, went green. So I think a movement has started, a green movement has started. A follow up, sir. Uh, in your estimation, what has been the value of Guyana's participation at these high level forums like COP22 for the advancement of the country's green state policy? As I said, Wendy, you can't uh, become a green state on your own. Um, when we speak of global warming, when we speak of sea level rises, you're speaking about the entire Caribbean, the entire Pacific. So we have to interact with international organizations. So that is valuable in a sense. Um, over 190 states are working together to uh, counteract the adverse um, effects of uh, global warming. We have been able to establish new partnerships for example, uh, we already have a partnership with Norway, we have received assistance from Germany, and we are collaborating with Japan, Netherlands, and other countries. So by going to COP, um, the COP series of meetings, we continue to engage with uh, countries which can help us. We continue to demonstrate our commitment to becoming a green state, and we learn. We learn from those other states. And um, that, is, that has been a great benefit to Ghana, it's been a great benefit to me. And it has helped us to define our policy much better. So we have a good team here in the Ministry of the Presidency. On the 1st of October, as you know, I set up the Department of Environment. And we've started to introduce small changes. For example, on the first of, same 1st of October, we established um, a practice called National Tree Day. So we plant trees and we look after existing trees. And there'll be other measures which will um, eventually percolate in the, in the school system to ensure that we become a green state. Thank you, sir. Kiana. Thank you. Mr. President, 
There have been recent accusations from the opposition's camp that your government has not been forthcoming with all of the information regarding the Durban Park project. I believe the recent accusation is that the nation has not been made aware from the get-go that Dr. Rupert, Rupert Rupnarain was a or is a director on a company that was collecting donations on behalf of the project. How do you respond to accusations that not all has been transparent where this project is concerned? Well, to start with, um, Dr. Rupert O'Brien uh, has not committed any um, error. In fact, he is the representative on a company which is formally established. We have not concealed the company. It's called um, Homestead Development Incorporated, HDI. Uh, there are several directors. Dr. O'Brien, as you know, is the Minister of Education and he represents the government interest because the celebrations which we had aimed at at the time of the establishment of the company um, concern largely the 50th anniversary celebrations. So please don't attach any, uh, any blame or any fault to him. As the company is, I think it has been notified to the National Assembly. It is not a secret company. When we, when, when we entered office in uh, May last year, some ad hoc measures were put in place to rehabilitate the uh, Independence Monument, which had been neglected for a couple of decades, and to have the um, inauguration parade uh, at the, uh, at the uh, National Stadium. So I would say that certain ad hoc measures were put in place as early as May uh, 2015, and uh, it was decided that uh, a special purpose company called the HDI, the uh, Homestead Development Incorporated, would be used to continue the preparations which had been started until the government had passed the budget and uh, put other infrastructural uh, uh, institutions in place. And when that came to an end, um, the responsibility for HDI, um, that is particularly with regard to the urban park, was transferred to the Ministry of Public Infrastructure. So there's nothing secret or there's nothing criminal about the HDI. And uh, it did serve a purpose. And when the, when the purpose or when that usefulness came to an end, Responsibility was placed in the hands of the um, in the hands of the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, but we could not have done it before because of uncertainty about the budget and the speed with which we had to um, bring um, the project um, to a conclusion by May uh, um, this year. It's just one year, but we have now in Guyana the biggest sing the single biggest stadium. It can accommodate thirty thousand persons at a push. And it is a public um, asset, which is, will be there um, for all time. So we, we have, um, we have um, uh, a very important uh, institution that is open to all Guyanese. You can have your Diwali um, there. You can have um, uh, Christian crusades. You can have Hindu and Muslim ceremonies there. But we have a valuable asset that we did not have before. The previous administrations, you know, had attempted to <laughs> drain the swamps, literally, um, to use the words of another election campaign. Um, but uh, they spent several million dollars, but did not succeed. But our administration succeeded. May I have a follow-up, please? Uh, with the opposition again, uh, they, they stated that this company was only registered. How do you respond? To criticisms that this company was only registered in January of this year and works on the Durban Park commenced by the company since November 2015. Well, it is a matter of um, a month or two difference. Um, as I explained, when we went into office, um, budgetary provision was not made for the uh, construction of that uh, stadium in time for independent celebrations in May 2016. And it was felt um, prudent to establish a special purpose company called the Home Stretch Development Incorporated. Um, when we realized that, um, that uh, we had to engage in contracts and agreements with construction firm to bring, to um, build the, the stands and everything else that was involved in the 
in the um, in the stadium. And as soon as um, we could, we uh, terminated the work of that company and established the Ministry of Public Infrastructure as the sole with the sole responsibility to complete the project. So it the company itself only was only in existence for about six months. And I could regard it as a transitional company um, that enabled um, us to start. The work. We're very grateful for the work that the company did. We're very grateful for the citizens who came on board and assisted um, the government of Ghana to ensure that um, we had a stadium in time for the 26th of May. And I think a lot of Guyanese are proud of the, the asset which we now possess. It belongs to the Guyanese people. But just a follow up. Um, why create a company and not delegate the responsibility to a particular ministry? Well, I explained that just now. I said we did eventually, but because of the fact that the budget uh, had not made provision at that time for the um, construction of the stadium in time for the, uh, the celebrations in May 2016, it was felt prudent to use that company on a short-term basis um, to get the work done. And once the work was in progress, we transferred responsibility to the Ministry of Public Infrastructure. It is, yes, it is unusual, but it was um, expedient at that time to follow that course of action. I would just like to um, draw your attention to the Russell issue. We've seen ongoing disrespect for government's um, labor laws and also Minister of um, Minister of Natural Resources, I believe at the last press conference, said that Minister Lawrence would have um, submitted a report on the way forward. Uh, would the government be open to considering something like a cease order since this issue has been going on for several years and it's still, you know, going on? Well, I don't think we need to reach the level of a cease order um, at this point in time. Uh, there are measures which could be put in place um, by the unions to ensure that the, the controversies are adjudicated. And I do not think those measures have been exhausted at this point in time. So I don't think the question of a cease order would, would apply. And um, I would urge that the Ministry of Social Protection, which is responsible for protecting this, the workers' rights, um, remain engaged with the company. And if necessary, we can have resort to legal means to ensure that the workers' rights are protected. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, you had spoken on several occasions about the fact that the electoral system needs to be revamped. There are some necessary changes that need to take place. What plans are in the pipeline to change the electoral system so that by the 2020 elections, um, results can be had in a faster time? You are suggesting that I made some proposals? No, I'm asking if proposals or plans are in the pipeline to ensure that by the next election time, results can be had in a faster time? We, we have um, embarked on a constitutional reform process. That is all I can say at this point in time. If it comes out of that process, I've asked that um, the process be countrywide and be consultative. And I would not predict um, the outcome of that process. As you know, uh, constitutional reform had started in the late 1990s and it was uh, the, the process was brought to an end around 2000 to have the elections in 2001. So there were um, several unimplemented measures and uh, our government, uh, true to its word, has restarted the process and I hope it can be completed by 2020. I don't know if the, uh, the results could be approved by the National Assembly by that time, but um, I wouldn't want to predict what the people will say. Whether there is need for change, um, um, we've had the system of proportional representation since um, 1964. That's um, 52 years now. And that is the foundation of our electoral system. I think you can see what happens in some countries um, where persons with fewer votes could win high office and persons with a greater number of votes would, would um, be runner up. So we have to be very careful how we think with these constitutions, you know, but. Um, I wouldn't say that uh, 
we should embark on any form of uh, electoral reform without um, going to the people. Time for one more quick question. Okay, sure. coming back to uh, Chikam, can you f confirm whether or not Dr. Steve Suresh Bali will be demitting office this year? And also, can you offer any updates on whether talks have been taking place on a suitable selection for the position of chairman of GCOM? Well, I can confirm that Dr. Suresh Bali has indicated his willingness to, or his desire to demit office. And I can confirm that I've written um, to the leader of the opposition in accordance with the Constitution, inviting him to submit a list of names um, which are not unacceptable to me to allow me to make a selection. So those are two things I can confirm. Kiana, you have a last question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, on one hand, sir, you have the belief of inclusionary democracy, and on the other, your government has constantly accused the opposition of being uh, the most corrupt regime of our time. Uh, do you still see the PPP, given all that has been said, as good partners for your arrangement for inclusionary democracy? The word good might be an exaggeration. As potential partners, um, we have to work with them. They represent 49% um, of the electorate, and we have to work with them, um, with, 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 with the PPP and other parties. So the answer is yes. Um, I would like to improve um, the engagement between the various parties. But they must be there. They must be in parliament. They, you know, um, the practice of boycotting there, you, you know, it's almost as if you're, you're um, talking to empty chairs. They must be present and they must uh, show a willingness to participate. We want to participate. The coalition government wants to participate more fully in, um, in the type of democracy you describe. And I believe it's good for Guyana. It, it would be good for Guyana for us to sit down at the table and work these, um, uh, think about the future of the country. Um, even though we continue to have different views, you would be surprised um, how close the objectives of the, of the um, coalition government are to, you know, what the uh, opposition says it wants, for example, on a green environment. I mean, the, the lead of the opposition has spoken about the need for um, a green environment, but essentially it's, it's, it's no different to what we've been saying. So I wish he would bring his ideas on board. He's been Minister of Finance for a long time. He's been President for 12 years. I think he, he can bring his ideas on board and, um, and let us work together. But boycotting is not the answer. Thank you, sir. I think that's all the time we have for this week's program. Thank you, Mr. President, for this past half hour. Thank you, uh, Kiana and Shanta, for joining us this week. And thank you, viewers, for watching. Do remember to join us again next week.